Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. It's on page 50 of the New Testament, portion of the Blue Bible, if you grabbed one on your way in and would like to read along. Listen again to the Word of God. Jesus said, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> you know, it's a great day for me. When I do not have to set an alarm and be told to wake up, it's a very rare treat. The real tragedy is when I do not, do not have an alarm set and my brain wakes up at the normal time anyways and goes to work overthinking about something trivial and I can't go back to sleep and actually take advantage of sleeping in. Or, you know, how about when you have an alarm set and something, or you just wake up like 10 minutes before it's set to go off? Maybe it's the middle of the night. Well, you know, so my family and I, we were called to FPCA in 2016. And because of the hyperactive real estate market at that time, we literally had one day to come and find a house to move to. And our realtor took us to all these neighborhoods we never heard of, right? I mean, well, the Lake Arlington area, Pantego, <laughs> Dow Worthington Gardens, what name is that? Uh, Kennedale, down to Mansfield. Uh, we had zero geographical understanding where we were, like after a house or two. I think we saw nine houses that day. One of the last ones we saw reminded us of the house that we were leaving. It was a house and neighborhood that we just adored. And so it was kind of comforting to find a house so familiar. And yeah, it was a little down the road from church, but you know, I mean, growing up in Dallas, that was no big thing. We're used to driving anywhere anyways. Our offer was accepted. We began preparing to move in, making a few trips to, to see it again, right? Have the inspection, all that kind of stuff. And everything was perfect until it wasn't. I remember being uh, at the house when the kids' room were being repainted. And I heard this noise, one I had not heard before while at this house. I walked over to, uh, to Colton's soon-to-be window, which faced the front, and immediately called Chelsea. Yeah, I'm watching the train 
go right by in front of our house. Now, it actually ran behind uh, our neighbors across the street. I mean, they were even closer. But it was like it'd be basically right across the street. It might as well have been our front yard. <laughs> now, again, being a city boy, I'm used to some of that ambient city noise. Even a gentle clickety-clack of a passing train can easily fade into the background. But there's nothing gentle or peaceful of a train's horn blaring <laughs> as it passes by. Daytime, nighttime, doesn't matter. And I think some of those engineers were just really having fun, right? They said, here's a neighborhood. <laughs> and we fought through it as long as we could. Uh, the family began pleading to move away, but I was stubborn, right? You can't let the train win. <laughs> and I held out pretty good until January 7th, 2019. How do I remember that day? Well, that evening was the College Football National Championship. Happened to be uh, where Clemson destroyed Alabama. But I was staying with it because those were the last precious quarters of college football for many, many months. Fourth quarter, score was 44 to 16. Everybody in the house was asleep. Well, I mean, I was watching, I was, the game kind of put me to sleep on the couch. Out of nowhere. <laughs> Chelsea, the boys, wide awake. I'm scared half to death. And the next morning, I gave in. The train won, and we moved. Now, that dang horn served a purpose, though. More than just ruining our sleep. Right? As it approached this intersection by our house, it announced very loudly that it was coming in order that cars and people did not get obliterated, and we all believe that's a good thing. And Jesus' words in Mark 13 remind me of that train horn. His words are meant to not just wake us up, but to stimulate us to stay awake and stay alert. And growing up, my Little League baseball coach often shouted a phrase from the dugout or as we began practice, look alive, look alive. <laughs> and if you ever tried coaching eight-year-olds or younger at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, you understand the need to maybe use this phrase every now and then. I sure have. I need to use it in here sometimes. <laughs> Kidding, of course, or am I? No, but whether it's in sports, school, your job, it's never a good thing to be told to look alive, wake up, stay alert. Why is this the message on the first Sunday of Advent? Where are Mary and Joseph? Where's Elizabeth? What's the deal with all this apocalyptic imagery? That's not in any of the Christmas songs I listen to during this season. Do you see any of those kinds of decorations around? Matt, do you have any apocalyptic Christmas on the tree? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. Often during Advent, we find ourselves looking backwards to the birth of Jesus, and that's appropriate. But if Advent means to, to wait and to prepare, then why are we preparing ourselves for something that happened, right, 2,000 years ago? That doesn't make any sense. That's instead because of looking back all the time, Jesus is telling us to look forward to his return. Just like the generations of faithful Jews who waited expected and prepared for the Messiah, we are to do the same thing. And I like how Martin Copenhaver put it. 
He said, our contemporary anticipation of the coming of God's promised one at Christmas is quite different from the experience of those who awaited the Messiah. After all, we know whom we are waiting for. We know the day he will arrive. It's circled in red on our calendars. We have Advent calendars and Advent candles to help us count down to the promised day. By contrast, of course, those who lived before the birth of Jesus did not know the day uh, of the hour of his arrival, so they needed to live in a continual state of watchfulness. By anticipating the return of the Son of Man here at the beginning of Advent, we wait in the same way as those who lived before Jesus was born waited, not knowing the day or hour when the Messiah would appear. And so I think we need to ask ourselves, are we waiting for Christmas or are we waiting for Christ? Those are two very different things. Are the things that exhaust us during this season, right? the stress, the busyness, the shopping, the parties, maybe working that extra shift to afford presents for kids, right? The things that push us to the coffee pot to artificially keep us awake and alert, are those things pushing us to Christmas Day or are they pushing us to Christ? <coughs> we are keeping ourselves awake. We're doing our best to look alive, but often it's for the wrong purpose. And count me as guilty as anyone else. If we are hyperactively awake and alert and alive for Christmas while sleepwalking when it comes to Christ. Now through chapter 13, Jesus uses common scenarios, scriptures, and metaphors to make his point, some more relevant to us than others. Now the biggest shock that comes in chapter 13 to many of his hearers was his prediction of the destruction of the temple. And then he warned his followers of false teachers and imitators. He told them there, there will be wars and rumors, rumors of war, earthquakes and famines. Persecution was coming, but through that persecution, the, the gospel would be preached to governors and kings and all the nations. The faithful who, were, who will endure will be saved. And that there would be cosmic events, right? The darkening of the sun and moon. These are referencing the words of the prophets of Amos and Joel, Ezekiel and Isaiah. Christ's elect would be gathered from north, south, east and west to him. Again, using imagery from Isaiah, Micah and Zechariah. And so William Barclay summarizes Jesus' words this way. When we read the pictorial words of Jesus about the second coming, we must remember that he, is not, that he is giving us neither a map of eternity nor a timetable to the future, but that he is simply using the language and the pictures that many a Jew knew and used for centuries before him. Today we might say it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Now, where Jesus probably loses some of that pictorial effect with us, at least I know with me, is the example of the fig tree. I would never look to one of those as some kind of spiritual wake-up call. Where would I even look for a fig tree in the, in the first place? I don't know about you, but they're not in my yard or my neighborhood. Usually, the only time I come across a fig is when it's mashed up in a, in a fig newton. <laughs> you would think I was crazy if you found me outside examining the branches of a fig tree trying to interpret signs and seasons. But for his audience, that's what they did. It was crucial to monitor the branches, study the changes, 
prune and tend them because it might have been their farm, their means of income. It was a source of food. So they had to do those things. Now back in chapter 11, Jesus pointed to a fruitless fig tree and he cursed it. It was a symbol of the temple's corruption and its future destruction. Right? It was a hopeless scenario. But here, whether it's the fig tree, it's the man on a journey in his household, even the somewhat scary reading cosmic events and wars, Jesus does not point to this tree as a curse or a negative sign, nor a hopeless scenario. It's actually a sign of hope. He's saying that, yes, things will get worse before they get better. But there are buds of hope sprouting if we take the time to examine the branches. And the only way we can do that is if we are awake to what God is doing. And not just technically or scientifically awake, not sleepwalking, not coffeeed up just to make it through the afternoon, but looking alive. Look for the alive. Look for God working in and through human history to bring hope to us. That's the difference between looking for Christmas and looking for Christ. The Interpreter's Bible might say it best. And no, it was first published in 1952, but tell me that this is any less true today. Let's contrast that with the characteristic messianic hope of the 20th century, modern man's secular apocalypse. He looks for a world of wonders which science and industry will provide. He has exchanged his august faith in God's coming action for a faith in the kind of plastic heaven that comes out of a factory. We are kept in a state of nervous excitement with prophecies of the world of tomorrow, a paradise of chromium and ceramics, of helicopters and television, of egg-shaped automobiles and layer cake houses, of skyscrapers made of glass and clothing made of soybeans. He puts an exclamation point. That's crazy, right? He says, what a trade. Heaven for earth, God for gadgets, the coming of Christ in the life of the world for the coming of a salesman's paradise. The lesson today, though, is not to enjoy the season, right, and go full bah humbug. <laughs> Have fun. Celebrate the parties. Imitate God and the wise men and give gifts. There's nothing inherently wrong with these things, but while doing all these things, look alive. Stay awake to what God is doing in the world. Because I see it here today. I've seen it every Sunday since we've been crammed in the fellowship hall. And very few of you have been able to claim your seat. And, <laughs> and you end up sitting and reading and praying uh, doing all these things with people you might normally not sit with in the sanctuary. It's a beautiful thing. It's a sign. It's a, it's a preview of things to come in the kingdom of God. And we're going to hear a, a greeting and receive an update from Presbyterian Children's Home and Services. Right? More buds. So finally, even though it feels like winter is finally trying to work its way in, there are buds of life popping up if you are awake and looking. And that is the hope we need this Advent season. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.